All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our high rounds uh, for today. Uh, we have the pleasure to have uh, Dr. Susan Little, uh, who's a professor of medicine here at UCSD. Uh, she's gonna be presenting on uh, part three of our CROI 2023 uh, review on HIV prevention. Uh, but just a quick introduction. Uh, Dr. Little completed her fellowship training in infectious diseases at UCSD School of Medicine. She completed a residency uh, training in an internal medicine at Washington University. Um, Dr. Little earned her medical degree from Washington University uh, School of Medicine in St. Louis. Uh, she, is uh, she is both board certified in internal medicine and infectious diseases. Uh, she's currently the co-director of the uh, AVRC and clinical research site leader for the ACTG site here at UCSD. Um, she conducts translational clinical research focus on the pathogenesis prevention and treatment of acute and very recent HIV infection. So thank you, Dr. Little for doing this review and go ahead thank and take you. it away. All right, thanks everybody. So I think in the title that was circulated, I was doing HIV testing and prevention, but there wasn't a lot on testing and there was a lot on prevention. So that's what we're gonna focus on. Um, and I'm going to cover these areas. Um, I, since I think some of these topics have the potential to change the way we practice in our clinics, um, I decided to do a little bit of a deeper dive on several of these things rather than to try and do a fast uh, sweep over of too many topics. So Levi, whoa, sensitive. Levi syndrome is first, and we will begin there. So the Levi syndrome is the long acting early viral inhibition syndrome. I will never remember that again, but basically uh, presented by Susan Eshelman. And by way of background, um, this study was based out of HPTN 083, but um, uh, for HIV PrEP uh, long acting CAB, efficacy has been shown to be superior to oral FTC TDF in HPTN 083 for cisgender MSM and transgender women and HPTN-084 among cisgender women. So in this study, they focused on HPTN-086. There were six cases of HIV infection that occurred despite on-time LA-CAB injections. And this report describes a case, um, and she doesn't really tell us how often this occurs, but um, it describes a case from HPTN-083 of a patient who received uh, LA-CAB prep with, uh, who then developed this Levi syndrome. So um, this involves delayed detection of HIV infection, rapid tests and antigen antibody tests often fail to detect HIV infection in the setting of CAB LA prep. Viral suppression and delayed or diminished antibody expression can persist for months after infection, even after the injections are discontinued, obviously because of the long tail. Um, and then, you know, the concern here is that delayed detection may lead to unnecessary continued CAB LA injections delayed art initiation, the potential to impact personal health or ongoing transmissions, and the emergence of inst resistance. So um, in HPTN-083, uh, detection of infection was delayed in about half of the CAB um, arm infections. Uh, and this was rarely observed, however, when the infection occurred more than six months after the last CAB-LA administration. So we're focused on um, on time and delayed CAB arm infections, but as long as they're within the infections that occurred within six months um, after CAB. So this is the case study. Um, and in this case, um, the green lines mark the CAB LA injections, the orange, the CAB concentration here. Um, and what you can see is that the first positive visit occurred here 26 weeks um, after study initiation um, in the setting of on-time um, CAB uh, LA injections. However, the study site did not detect this infection until three months later out here. Um, and at that time, antigen antibody tests were reactive um, and a viral load was not detectable. This one, um, a quantitative viral load with a lower limit of quantification of 20 copies per ml. Um, the, the site went back and was able to pull um, samples from the week 26. And at that time found that the antigen antibody test was also it was non-reactive, but a qualitative RNA was positive. This time, this one had a level of detection of 30 copies per ml. 
And then in John Miller's lab, um, they did single copy um, viral load detection and came up with a viral load of 6.1 copies per ml. So um, genotyping failed at this first time point, uh, 26 odd weeks um, after um, the start of study. Um, but nine months later, um, they were able to detect integrase here, um, um, drug resistance. Um, and at this time, the discriminatory antibody was positive. The qualitative RNA was reactive with a viral load of 23. So what this study highlights is assay reversion. So starting here um, with the days since the first positive visit, zero all the way out to you know almost a year, um, the rapid tests go back and forth, fluctuate between non-reactive and reactive. Um, and honestly, there isn't really a consistent pattern. Uh, the antigen antibody test is becoming more reactive out here towards you know six months a year. Um, the qualitative RNA with the limit of detection of 30, again, long period of non-reactive. And then again, more tests out here, but you know, note out here, the single copy assay, uh, sorry, the, the quantitative was um, less than 40 and this one single copy assay they did up here. So um, a lot of fluctuation. And so just to compare how this Levi syndrome compares to acute HIV infection, because clearly this person ha is infected and is technically acutely infected, but obviously acute infection um, phase of natural HIV infection where this Levi syndrome occurs in the setting of long acting antiviral PrEP, the prototype here being CAB-LA. Um, this is a new infection. This is also a new infection, but it's occurring during PrEP or um, after the initiate, when PrEP is initiated during acute or early infection. Here, viral replication with acute infection is explosive compared to very smoldering, um, uh, highly symptomatic. We all know these symptoms in the setting of acute HIV, but symptoms with this Levi syndrome were minimal, variable, and often completely without symptoms. Um, detection, again, predictable here on the left, um, but with the Levi syndrome, the ultra-sensitive RNA assay was often low or undetectable with low and undetectable DNA um, and uh, diminished and or delayed antibody production. So assay reversion is rare in the setting of acute HIV infection in the absence of um, prolonged durable potent antiretroviral therapy and virologic suppression, but here is common uh, in the absence of um, uh, again, the ongoing presence of cab la prep, presumably in this tail. Um, the duration can be months um, and transmission, um, they hypothesize, is unlikely, except in the setting of a blood transfusion, given how low the viral load is. And drug resistance, yes, can emerge early, even in the setting of these very low viral loads. So in terms of sort of quantifying how common this was, INSTI resistance emerged in 10 out of 18 cases with CAB-LA administration, again, within that six months um, when CAB-LA had been delivered within six months of the first positive test. Um, that's not exactly the same thing as saying the Levi syndrome, but again, I presume that's about the frequency. Um, so it's still very rare. Um, INSTI resistance was not observed when the first positive visit was more than six months after CAB administration. And retrospective testing with a sensitive RNA assay detected most infections before INSTI resistance emerged. So um, RNA testing recommended currently by the CDC and within the CAB FDA um, package insert um, how in the screening for um, HIV infection um, and in follow-up for CAB LA prep but it is not and was not part of the HPTN 083084, hence the reason uh, I think some of these were not detected um, as promptly as one would have hoped. So in conclusion, infections with on-time CAB LA uh, injections are rare, but the detection of infection in the setting of CAB LA is often delayed using rapid and uh, antigen antibody tests for screening. Um, RNA assays do detect infections earlier, often before resistance emerges, but you really have to have a high level of suspicion when you see any of these tests that um, turn up positive, even in the setting of on-time injections. Um, and obviously we need further research to evaluate the use, how, you know, how best RNA, HIV RNA screening can be used in this settings and to determine whether or not this syndrome occurs with other potent long-acting PrEP agents. 
So now I'm going to dive into doxypep. And there was a lot of data here. So um, I, I'm going to try and again, to me, this these data are compelling enough to influence the way we practice. So just by way of background, um, this is not data presented at CROI. Doxypep, um, effective uh, art um, in the setting of U equals U and HIV prep um, have been linked to increases in sexual contact and decreases in condom use. So along comes doxypep. Um, doxycycline is a moderate spectrum, second generation tetracycline that's generally well tolerated. It's rapidly and almost completely absorbed after oral administration. And doxyprophylaxis as both PEP and PrEP to prevent syphilis, which is gonna be TP, chlamydia, CT, and gonorrhea, NG, um, had prior to this meeting already been presented and or published in two randomized controlled trials, the doxypep and the Epergay trial. So just a little bit of background on those two trials, what was presented prior to CROI. So um, blocking doxy taken after condomless sex as post-exposure prophylaxis um, in this, um, in the Epergay trial um, is shown here um, where a 70% reduction in chlamydia was observed um, as compared and a 63% reduction in syphilis. So highly effective for these two STIs, but it was not effective for gonorrhea. So again, this has already been published back in 2018. And then doxypep um, was this study by uh, Annie Lukemeyer at uh, UCSF was pre just presented in July at the IAS um, last year. Um, and this intervention, not published, but presented, this intervention was, and I should mention doxypep for all of the studies I'm presenting is 200 milligrams taken as PEP within 72 hours after condomless sex up to once daily. So in the doxypep study, um, men who have sex with men and transgender women uh, living with HIV um, were randomized to doxypep or no PEP um, two to one and uh, MSM and transgender women on PrEP um, were also randomized to this same regimen. So again, living with HIV and on PrEP. Um, inclusion criteria were um, living with HIV or on PrEP greater than or equal to one STI in the past 12 months. Um, keep that in mind because that's a recurring theme here. Um, condomless sex and then quarterly three site um, G gonorrhea chlamydia testing, RPR and culture before treatment when available. And this was this took place in San Francisco and Seattle. So these are the data again presented in July. And what you can see here, just to orient, this is the percent of quarterly um, visits with an STI, uh, the percentage over here in the, um, blocking my view, in the um, PrEP cohort on the left and the people living with HIV cohort on the right, um, and doxycycline PEP on the left, standard of care on the right for both of them. So what you can see is that for um, uh, gonorrhea, here's my legend, can't see my legend, but nonetheless, darker is um, more highly resistant. Um, and um, what you can see basically summarized over here is the reduction um, across both the PrEP and people living with HIV, cohort PrEP and people living with HIV. Gonorrhea here um, significantly reduced um, the presence of STIs each quarter, 55% in the PrEP arm and 57% in the people living with HIV arm. Um, chlamydia, again, significant reduction um, in STIs, 88% in the PrEP arm, 74% in the people living with HIV arm, and syphilis, 87% reduction in the PrEP arm and 77% in the people living with HIV. This was a trend only in the people living with HIV, but note these numbers are very small. So, um, uh, you know, th th all of these findings were highly significant except for this last one, which was a trend but again, very small numbers in the syphilis category. So um, again, in the doxypep um, study, um, they looked at goncockle tetracycline culture-based susceptibility whenever it was possible. Um, that ended up being about 30% of um, uh, gonorrhea endpoints that have resisted, had resistance data. Um, uh, tetracycline susceptibility um, as shown um, and again, at baseline, there were about 20% uh, of people who had tetracycline resistance, and that's consistent with um, US data. So shown over here 
you can see um, tetracycline susceptible in green, resistant at about 20%. That's again, what's consistent with the US data. And then this intermediate here in the orange yellow color. And going forward over time, um, they found um, a slight increase in uh, tetracycline resistance in the doxypep arm, no real change in the standard of care arm. And um, again, uh, well, we'll get to their hypothesis related to that. Um, again, worth noting, um, you've already picked up, um, there was um, efficacy for reduction of gonorrhea in this study, but in the US, our population of uh, tetracycline doxycorrelate uh, is about 20% as compared to France during Ypres-Gay when it was 56 and higher yet uh, subsequently. I see one chat. Feel free if you want to break in and tell me what that is, Marvin, or... Uh, no, it's, a, that, no, it's okay. a question related to your first presentation. So we'll... Uh, okay. I'll, yeah, we'll hold on to okay. that. Okay, hold on. Okay. So doxypep within 72 hours substantially reduced the incidence of bacterial STIs by 62% overall in people living with HIV, 66% in those taking uh, PrEP. And there was a substantial reduction of each bacterial STI, including gonorrhea. It was well tolerated, um, high self-reported adherence. I skipped that data. Um, doxypep has the potential to be effective as a prevention strategy, particularly in populations with a high STI incidence, where again, in this study, a 30% reduction was seen per quarter. Um, but need larger studies, ongoing surveillance, and need to assess the impact of um, antibiotic resistance. And that is the subject of the CROI presentation. So this is where we start CROI. So the first study presented um, was uh, DOXYVAC. Um, so a French study, open label randomized trial. Um, and again, tiny bit of background, we've already covered this. Um, and in their previous study, the Ypres-Gay study, 70% um, uh, reduction in chlamydia and, and syphilis, but no effect on gonorrhea. And again, they quote the high level of background resistance. Um, but in this study, they introduce a vaccine, meningococcal B vaccine, and why? So historically, in some observational studies, um, uh, meningoc the meningococcal B vaccine has been associated with 26 to 46 percent reduction in gonorrhea in these observational studies. So in this study, they introduced the 4C meningococcal B vaccine, which I'll go into some greater detail on. Um, and it contains, um, um, uh, OMV, I forgot what OMV stands for. Um, yeah, I'll get to that in a second. <laughs> that are shared with Neisseria gonorrhea. Um, uh, and there's about 44 to up to 90% homology, but in particular, this one um, uh, external protein, surface protein, um, uh, is uh, highly homologous and exposed. And so their proposal is they need confirmation to assess antibiotic resistance. Um, but here's the meningococcal vaccine background that I inserted for myself as well as for anybody else. So the meningococcal conjugate, men ACWY, protects against these four serotype groups of Neisseria. CDC recommends this vaccination for all 11 to 12 year olds with a booster at 16 years and among children and adults at increased risk for meningococcal disease, such as people with HIV. The group B meningococcal vaccine, um, which is the one used in this study, protects against Neisseria meningitidis sero serogroup B, um, which accounts for, let's see, in the US, um, serogroup B is about 42% of overall causes of meningitis, and uh, C is the other most common at 26 um, from a previous study about five years ago. So this four component meningococcal B vaccine is the only um, vaccine authorized for use in all age groups. Um, it has variable coverage against these ACWXY strains. Um, and again, CDC recommends meningococcal B vaccine for people 10 years or older at increased risk for meningococcal disease, i.e. people um, living in close quarters with the potential for outbreaks um, and among men who have sex with men. So, um, this vaccine, um, the first vaccines developed against um, meningococcal V, their outer membrane vesicles, why couldn't I remember that, were based on outer membrane vesicles, and these were designed for specific strains. And so they had very poor 
um, coverage across a diverse range. Um, so the 4CN uh, men B, the meningococcal B, 4CN men B uh, vaccine contains over here, these three recombinant proteins, um, uh, antigens, um, and only the, um, uh, this is the Neisserial heparin binding uh, antigen, um, which is uh, surface exposed. And because it is surface exposed here, it is thought that it may confer um, some um, protection against Neisseria gonorrhea. Not gonna go through the whole table over here. But again, as I mentioned before, these observational studies showed that um, retrospective observational studies that people had been protected um, in adolescents and young adults in Australia and the US um, at 30 to 40%-ish. So now we're moving back to CROI. So this is the study design. Um, so this is a multi-center, um, this is DOCSIVAC, um, multi-center two by two factorial randomized open label superiority phase three trial. So men who have sex with men on PrEP um, for greater than six months were enrolled. They had to have had a bacterial STI in the prior 12 months uh, and be asymptomatic. And this is a large study. So people are randomized a two to one to doxypep or no pep and one to one between the vaccine and no vaccine. And then again, the um, uh, vaccine is given at month zero and month two and uh, doxypep as previously described within 72 hours post-sex and up to daily. Um, their primary endpoints were the impact of doxypep on the time to first episode of syphilis or chlamydia um, and the impact of the vaccine on time to first episode of Neisseria, quarterly visits um, for testing. So um, in, as this study, the doxyvac was being con, um, um, pursued, the results of doxypep were released. Um, and these results I've already described. And so because of these um, preliminary uh, or DSMB uh, results from doxypep that halted the trial, um, the doxyvac DSMB requested an unblinded analysis on patients enrolled during this window uh, in September and found significant effectiveness of both interventions and recommended that they stop enrollment, offer doxypep and the vaccine to all, and that is what happened. So this presentation is up, contains data that were presented up, to, that were collected up to the time of the DSMB halting the study. So again, um, 546 were screened, um, same number randomized, a large number then analyzed. And the main point of this uh, figure is that um, between um, doxypep uh, and discontinuation and uh, vaccines and discontinuations, there are really a very small number of, of discontinuations overall. So um, these are the baseline characteristics. I'm gonna really just jump over here to the far right, the total. These are primarily white um, uh, men born in France um, and the mean duration of PrEP use was 42 months um, and STIs in the prior 12 months were very prevalent. Uh, mycoplasma genitalium was also evaluated in this study, um, relatively low frequency. Um, condomless sex here, um, and uh, in the four weeks, five events in the four weeks prior to study and uh, an average of 10 partners in the last three months. And I should say they were well balanced across the arms. So the, this is the um, first um, primary endpoint of the study, which is time to first chlamydia or syphilis infection. They looked and found no interaction between doxypep and the vaccine between the two arms. And really, the, just looking to the right, um, these are the um, these are the outcome data showing a clear benefit of um, doxypep in reducing the probability of or the time, sorry, to first STI infection in black compared to red, um, with a hazard ratio of 0.16 or an 84% reduction in the probability. Um, they then separated these two um, uh, uh, bacterial STIs and looked at time to first chlamydia and time to first syphilis. And again, highly significantly effective effect um, of doxypep um, with, for chlamydia, an 89% reduction in the probability of the event as compared to syphilis, a 79% reduction in the probability. Um, 
Then they looked at um, a secondary outcome, which is time to first um, gonorrhea and mycoplasma genitalium infection in the doxypep arm. Um, and again, a highly effective um, reduction in time to first uh, gonorrhea event um, and uh, at 51% uh, reduction um, and 45% um, uh, reduction in um, mycoplasma gonorrhea. So looking at resistance um, in this study, um, resistance for um, gonorrhea and chlamydia, um, again, as with all, whoops, go back. As with all of these studies, there were a low number, a small number of samples that were really available to analyze. There were 65 cultures available for resistance testing for gonorrhea, which was about 15% of the PCR positive um, uh, samples. Um, tetracycline MICs were determined and um, are really shown here. So at baseline, um, resistant, uh, 100%. Again, note, note the number, seven. Um, but again, um, resistance had been high several years ago and appears to be higher yet. Um, so 100% at baseline and um, uh, uh, high level resistance um, was seen in 30% in the doxypep and a somewhat lower percentage, but these were not statistically different. Um, so um, in chlamydia, even a smaller number of strains were tested for tetracycline resistance, um, uh, but no samples were available um, for samples, none from the PEP arm, um, and um, uh, no tetracycline resistance was observed. So in terms of adherence, adherence was very good going from month three across to month 12. Um, adherent yes is in blue, so 80-ish percent adherence throughout. Um, and the median time um, uh, to PEP intake was 27 hours after sex. The median number of pills per month was seven. Um, and again, a very low rate of discontinuation. Um, so then we move to the vaccine arm. Um, again, no interaction between the doxypep and the vaccine. Um, and looking over here to the right, um, comparing um, the, yeah, comparing the um, uh, time to first episode of gonorrhea, um, there was a reduction of uh, 51% as shown um, vaccine in blue. And um, that was time to first event. They then looked at the overall cumulative incidence of gonorrhea infections, <clears throat> excuse me, in the vaccine. Um, arm and saw that um, the, the, there was no significant difference, although there was a trend um, in the overall uh, cumulative incidence with um, uh, uh, this, the vaccine arm in blue and the no vaccine arm here. And again, um, uh, a trend, but not uh, significant. And I should mention um, that gonorrhea infections were considered um, beginning at month three through the duration of the study because that was uh, after sort of an effective window um, uh, for vaccine administration, one month after the second vaccine. So um, adverse events, just put this up to show they were extremely rare um, in the um, doxypep arm, um, the mm -mm -mm, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, so GI sy symptoms, and in the um, vaccine arm, um, um, reactogenicity with pain at the injection site and some redness. And so predictable um, <clears throat> uh, adverse events, but um, uh, very few, um, uh, no serious adverse events and uh, very few um, grade three or four. And again, treatment discontinuation, extremely rare. Um, so what about <clears throat> changes in sexual behavior? Um, shown um, here, uh, the number of sex partners in the prior three months. Um, and in the, um, sorry, the uh, vaccine arm versus no vaccine, and then condomless sex acts uh, in the prior four weeks, vaccine arm, no vaccine. On the bottom is the doxypep arm. Uh, again, um, sexual partners on the left, condomless sex on the right. So again, no real change during the entire duration of the study in sexual behavior. So in summary, um, 
now three large studies um, showing significant reductions of STIs among MSM. The Epergay, which had been um, uh, presented prior to uh, CROI, DOXYPEP, which was presented prior to CROI, and now the DOXYVAC study. Um, DOXYPEP is well tolerated with high self-reported adherence um, and ongoing evaluations of antibiotic resistance are underway. Um, the vaccine reduced the incidence of first episode of GC, again, notably um, not clear whether this is necessary in the U.S., but certainly um, in um, uh, France, where there's an extremely high rate of um, tetracycline resistance, um, this was an effective approach. No magic bullet. Um, and STI research, a scientific priority to meet, meet the 2030 WHO UNAIDS targets to reduce incidence of HIV and STIs by 90%. So worth thinking about these approaches. Um, and so Annie Lut Lukemeyer um, presented an update on the DOXYPEP study, um, looking at antimicrobial resistance in gonorrhea and commensal Neisseria and Staph aureus. So this is her um, presentation. Um, and again, background we've already covered. She presented this um, at IAS showing that among um, uh, the PrEP arm in the is solid among um, uh, people taking PrEP, sorry, people taking PrEP are in the blue um, with, um, how do I say this? Uh, DoxyPep <laughs> is um, in blue. People living with HIV are in the dashed lines and the solid lines are people on standard of care again here. So we've really shown already that there was a highly effective uh, impact on the incidence of gonorrhea, chlamydia, and syphilis, 65% per quarter among men who have sex with men and transgender women, again, with a history of S an STI in the past 12 months. So in this presented study, they looked at um, uh, doxy resistance in Neisseria, uh, gonorrhea, Staph aureus, and non-pathogenic Neisseria species. So. Um, uh, at this point, uh, they had 637 participants randomized. We've already been through this. Resistance samples were taken. Um, the DSMB halted the study. And um, these are the testing <clears throat> uh, that was done for drug resistance. And just to note, some standard of care participants did receive DOXY for interval STI treatment. So Neisseria gonorrhea, um, everyone was swabbed at gonorrhea diagnosis prior to treatment. And um, uh, tetracycline resistance was done by agar dilution um, when uh, samples were available. Staph aureus, uh, nasopharyngeal oropharyngeal swabs were taken at months 0, 6, and 12. And again, doxy resistance by E test. And then commensal Neisseria oropharyngeal swabs at months 0 and 12, um, and doxy resistance by E test. So, this is a summary. I did not go through her entire presentation because it's very long but just the take-homes. Um, for Neisseria gonorrhea, in the setting of a greater than 50% reduction in gonorrhea with doxypep, tetracycline resistant was present in um, three baseline gonorrhea isolates, four incident gonorrhea isolates in the doxypep arm, and two uh, in the um, standard of care arm. Um, uh, suggest that doxypep may be less protective against tetracycline resistant strains. However, the numbers are very small. Um, they were really unable to assess doxypep as a driver of tetracycline resistance. We need larger studies and more long-term surveillance, more surveillance, more long-term studies to really assess this. They also looked at um, Staph aureus. Um, doxypep was associated with a 14% absolute reduction in colonization and an 8% absolute increase in doxy resistance compared to baseline. However, when looking at strains of higher importance, uh, methicillin resistant Staph aureus, uh, the prevalence was low, 6%, and doxy resistant MRSA was unchanged with doxy PEP use. So I think that's critically important um, since that's a primary mode of therapy, um, method of therapy for MRSA. And then finally, non-pathogenic Neisseria, nearly two-thirds of the isolates had a pre-existing had pre-existing doxy resistance, but this didn't change during the course of doxy PEP use. So again, she comments, um, limited follow-up, small number of gonorrhea isolates available from incident cases, really, really small, um, and standard of care participants received doxy for incident STIs. 
But the conclusions overall, um, really remarkable. Doxypep is an important prevention strategy in men who have sex with men and transgender women um, with an elevated STI risk. It reduced STI 65% every three months in the parent RCT and reduced the need for antibiotics to treat those STIs, such as decreased ceftriaxone for gonorrhea by 50% in the doxypep arm. Um, in this subset of doxypep participants with antimicrobial resistance data, which was very small, they did not find uh, a markedly increased uh, doxy resistance, but again, need longer term implementation and um, surveillance to better understand this. So um, now we're going to look at um, another study that looked at um, uh, doxypep um, internationally because the results are striking. Um, so this is an open label one-to-one -one randomized trial. Again, doxy as with all the other studies, quarterly testing as with all the other studies. 450-ish um, non-pregnant cisgender women uh, aged 18 to 30 taking PEP prep were enrolled in Kisumu, Kenya. So, um, and, uh, so this is a, a different population. All of the other studies have not been in resource limited settings. Uh, quarterly follow-up uh, with endocervical swabs for STI NAT um, and treatment as needed um, and weekly SMS surveys on the frequency of sex and doxy use. And I'm gonna move pretty quickly um, through this. Um, so um, there were, the patient participants were um, young, uh, they had been um, on a median of uh, seven-ish months of HIV prep at the time of study start, and the prevalence of bacterial STIs at baseline was very high at 18% in both arms, um, driven by high rates of chlamydia. Um, follow-up, 97% of all quarterly follow-up visits were completed. Um, equal in both arms. Um, weekly SMS survey response was 81%, very high. And the women assigned to the PEP arm reported event-driven dosing at 78%. So again, similar to the previous study, roughly 80% of weekly um, SMS surveys reported adherence. There were pregnancies and um, um, women who became pregnant during the course of the study had their um, doxycycline held. Um, and pregnancy holds for PEP accounted for 10% of follow-up time and all other holds 5% of follow-up time. And these are the results, note the difference. So this is time to first incident STI, absolutely no difference between the doxy PEP and the standard of care arm um, and the time to first incident chlamydia, again, no significant difference between um, the doxypep and the standard of care arm. So strikingly different um, than the previous two studies. So um, they just briefly secondary outcomes, there were no adverse reactions and no severe adverse reactions. Four participants unfortunately did report social harms related to PEP use. There were no incident HIV cases. And again, very small number of um, samples available for testing. But the six samples that were available um, for tetracycline resistance testing were all of them were resistant. And for Neisseria um, uh, at, at baseline, sorry, and 100% uh, also at follow up. Uh, there was no detection of tetracycline resistance uh, within the um, uh, chlamydia isolates. So, interpretation. Um, you know, I'm favor the interpretation down here at the bottom, uh, adherence. Um, despite uh, self-reported adherence, um, they proposed, however, that the anatomy could be different and the cervical tissue may differ from urethral, rectal, and pharyngeal, um, which is where previous samples had been taken. Um, resistance is a possibility. However, to date, there are no known cases of resistant chlamydia um, and high rates of resistant uh, Neisseria gonorrhea, but again, they saw no difference in the rates of chlamydia. Um, and uh, the trial was designed to maximize adherence and, um, uh, and self-reported adherence was high, 80%-ish, uh, but imperfect. Um, and so the, the real question, again, as we've seen, I think, in other studies is, you know, how, how likely is it that self-reported adherence was um, very good, 80%, but in fact, um, the medication was not taken as prescribed. So in conclusion, use of doxy, PEP, 
um, did not reduce incident STIs among cisgender women in uh, Kenya. The burden of STIs on cisgender women is large. STI prevention interventions remain needed. So um, then the, the last presentation on DOXY-PEP um, looks at how we might think about implementing DOXY-PEP in our clinical practices. Um, and this study by um, Michael Traeger um, addressed estimating how many SDIs could have been averted using different, doc, 10 different DOXY-PEP prescribing strategies and identified prescribing strategies to identify, uh, their aim was to identify prescribing patterns that minimized uh, DOXY-PEP use and maximized the impact on STIs. And um, their data um, was the Fenway Health um, FQHC in Boston. This is the largest PEP, PrEP sorry, provider in New England. Um, and they did an um, electronic health record uh, EMR-based cohort of gay and bisexual men, transgender women, and non-binary people assigned male sex at birth. They screened uh, the cohort for any that had greater than or equal to two STI events for chlamydia, gonorrhea, or syphilis during this time period. Um, and people with um, uh, HIV um, PrEP, sorry, people living with HIV PrEP users and non-PrEP users were all included. Um, so um, person time began at the first STI after January 1st, 2015, and they censored the study um, at the last STI, they censored the data at the last STI or December 31st, 2020. And again, they wanted to explore these 10 prescribing patterns, which I, I'm not listing, but you can pull up the data and create these counterfactual scenarios. Um, what would have happened if doxypep had been given in each of these 10 different, according to each of these 10 different prescribing patterns. Um, and um, their, their conclusion, um, and again, the prescribing patterns were give doxypep to all men who have sex with men, give doxypep to all MSM who are and transgender women, non-binary individuals who are taking PrEP, um, give it to people who have only had, who have had at least one STI in the last 12 months. So a variety of scenarios like that. And their final conclusion, let's go there. come on, there. Final conclusion was that prescribing uh, guidelines should incorporate recent STI diagnosis as an indication for doxypep, and that by prescribing um, for 12 months, um, uh, after an STI diagnosis, you could avert about 42% of STIs you would have averted. Um, more efficient than prescribing to all people living with HIV or all people taking, um, and prescribing after multiple STIs um, after, as opposed to just one, um, reduces um, the impact but improves efficiency. So um, they suggest that we consider people not on PrEP um, with an STI for doxypep. Um, following an STI diagnosis, doxypep had a similar um, efficacy for people with HIV, for PrEP users, and for non-PrEP users, and that by restricting um, uh, doxypep to subgroups of people, um, we may reduce um, our, our reach, um, the, the efficacy, the impact of, sorry, not the efficacy, the impact of this kind of intervention. So um, they highly recommend local epidemiology to target specific STIs, um, uh, but proposed that prescribing after a syphilis diagnosis could avert 25% of syphilis infections, but that covered only about 9% of people um, um, on doxy, that would cover only 9% of people on doxypep. Um, and um, background tetracycline resistance in gonorrhea was about 25% at this point. Uh, and again, note 60 to 80% in Europe. So there are strategies that can reduce um, can increase the impact um, by limiting the population treated, um, but reducing the, um, um, the breadth of doxypep prescription. Um, the sweet spots seem to be up here. All individuals, people living with HIV on PEP, sorry, on PrEP and not on PrEP, um, uh, who had at least one STI in the prior 12 months. So just a time check, yep. uh, Susan, we're at uh, 845. So oh, good, 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 good. I'll, I'll this, leave that I up think to I can you. do this quickly. Thank okay. you. So I'm going to cover um, FTDF for PrEP among women and just do this very quickly. Um, Jeannie Marazzo presented eight years of pooled um, adherence and incidence data. 
Um, and uh, she pooled data from 11 uh, FTDF demonstration projects in six countries over eight years, um, 6,000 plus participants to understand the efficacy of FTDF in cisgender women, um, and explored adherence in a subset with available, available objective and subjective data. So um, incidents, um, uh, they calculated an overall efficacy HIV incidence per 100 person years um, by Poisson regression in the entire project. And then among the 2,900 who had objective or self-reported data, they also reported uh, in, uh, adherence data. So adherence metrics, um, dried blood spots were the objective adherence metric, um, but only in 237 individuals. And adherence was graded according to um, Pete Anderson's uh, published scale, greater than or equal to seven tabs um, per week. Um, uh, with the level shown on down to less than two tablets with lower levels in dried blood spots. And then they had subjective adherence in 2800, electronic uh, pill cap monitors, um, pill counts, um, self-report, and they also graded these according to this same schedule. Um, and then finally, a self-reported um, uh, adherence scale, um, which again was also reported um, according to these four categories of excellent, very good or good, fair and poor, very poor. Um, and um, they used a novel um, strategy to look at group-based trajectory of adherence to identify patterns of adherence over 96 weeks, as opposed to cross-sectional adherence at a single time point. Um, these are the study sites. Um, and um, uh, the mean age was 25. And I'm just going to jump down to say um, lots of STIs and uh, commercial sex work um, and that was mostly limited uh, to the India site. But uh, there were only 49 individuals uh, from the US in this study. Um, so subjective adherence um, by visit uh, in the objective arm, um, uh, adherence declined as noted by the increase in the gray, which is the less than two tablets per week um, over the course of the study. The same was observed in the subjective arm, um, but with a more dramatic um, uh, increase in um, loss of adherence, I should say, and also worth noting the comparison between subjective where, you know, here at the beginning at week 16 through week 80, um, a significant majority report greater than or equal to seven tablets daily, as opposed to see how this contrasts with the objective data. So self-report um, probably overestimates uh, adherence. Um, and again, this is really the take home HIV incidence rate among women um, by pooling, um, well, first looking, uh, yes, pooling the consistent daily use and the four to six tabs consistently high use. Um, the incidence um, uh, per 100 person years was extremely low. And um, as compared to the um, less good adherence in the um, high but declining where uh, you can see the incidence per 100 person years and then finally the highest rate in the people with consistently low adherence. So um, even, oh, let me skip that. So limitations, pooled analysis uh, of uh, heterogeneous demonstration projects, different follow-up. Um, we have seen this many times, uh, objective adherence data was available for a limited number of people and um, provided, uh, reported, uh, these data suggest better um, that self-reported measures overestimate adherence. Um, and this group-based trajectory depends on sample size and duration of follow-up. But I think this is really the key point. The pooled analysis is the largest assessment of effectiveness and adherence of FTDF in a global real-world setting. And it showed that the effectiveness of this um, 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 PrEP was similar in cisgender women who demonstrated consistently high, that is greater than four tablets per week or very high seven tablets per week adherence. Um, so this is now comparable to the adherence efficacy relationship that's been previously reported for men who have sex with men. Um, uh, over half of all participants did not use um, FTDF consistently, highlighting the need for greater um, additional prevention options such as long acting. Um, so again, just to sort of highlight that, I think she didn't, she, she doesn't make the point that um, uh, PrEP at four doses per week in women is as effective as um, seven doses. Obviously, seven doses are encouraged, but simply um, uh, says that given the level of risk, 
that these um, cisgender women were experiencing four doses per week was protective, highly effectively protective. Um, and so now just a moment on the Mosaico trial, I'm gonna leave five minutes for questions. So I'm gonna go really fast. Um, uh, Susan Bookbinder presented this study, um, this the Mosaico trial um, vaccines at month zero and three using this ADS 26 vector mosaic that contains gag pol or envelope inserts, and then vaccinations at month six and 12 with the same ADS 26 uh, vaccine as well as um, soluble GP120 <clears throat> uh, again in uh, for the clade C and uh, for the mosaic. <clears throat> Sorry. The sites are noted here. Um, and uh, the overall randomization one to one, large number of individuals randomized to vaccine or placebo. Um, and at least 24 months after the third uh, vaccination. Um, let me skip that. Um, so I'm gonna just go straight to the characteristics. Um, so characteristics are shown here. Um, again, the US contributed 192 individuals, so only about 5% of the overall trial. Um, South America, Peru, uh, 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 Brazil, uh, and Argentina kind of constituted the largest um, uh, contribution of participants to this study. And the results, um, absolutely no impact of vaccine. Um, and, um, uh, oh, and I should have said the first was the intention to treat. This is the per protocol. Again, no effect of the vaccine at all. Well, go back. And the conclusion, um, the study recruited a diverse cohort of men who have sex with men and transgender persons. Um, everyone was counseled and offered linkage to PrEP. Um, if they chose to link to PrEP, they were not enrolled in the study. <clears throat> they were continued to be offered PrEP throughout the study. And if at any point during the study, they chose to initiate PrEP, they could and they did remain in the study. So despite ongoing risk reduction counseling and linkage to PrEP, HIV incidence, particularly in young participants in Latin America, was very high. So again, another unfortunately disappointing um, uh, vaccine study for HIV. Great. Thank you, uh, Susan, for that uh, review. And uh, we do walk. have about <laughs> five minutes. Uh, yeah. I'm going to kind of go from the start. There were a few comments, a lot of comments and a and, uh, few questions. Um, yeah. Uh, I think the first one was from Darcy Wooten in regards to why do guidelines recommend both HIV viral load and fourth generation for HIV screening in patients in long acting CAB versus just the viral load? Yeah, good question. Um, I, I think, <clears throat> I mean, now um, you might argue <laughs> that it makes more sense because of this Levi syndrome. It's possible, you know, there's these fluctuating um serologic and virologic responses so it's possible that one will be positive and one will be negative but the guidelines weren't written with the levi syndrome in mind so i don't um my best guess is that um it sort of covers people who don't have access to both but i i, I wonder now whether uh how i should say the guidelines might change um because this requires really much more intensive sampling um, and by doing both of those tests, you're more likely to maybe more likely to pick up a positive um, in somebody who has become infected while taking um, long acting prep um, and, and then subsequent follow up. You know, we don't all have bank samples to go back to. So it's really very close prospective follow up um, with repeat testing by a bunch of different modalities. Yeah, it's it's complicated. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, Nettie had a question uh, briefly about uh, with the LA uh, cab failures. Was there any uh, data presented on weight or other risk factors? No, uh, I, that had been presented um, has been presented previously. I didn't unfortunately look that up, but I think <clears throat> I don't. I, I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm ninety percent sure the weight has been has been presented previously as part of. 083 and 084, um, but in this, they just focused on the um, the Levi syndrome. Okay. Uh, I think Nettie had a comment regarding the, I think the Doxy uh, Pep uh, Kenya study. She thought that the uh, very high adherence is interesting. 
yeah. not what we commonly see. What, I wonder if it's true or, or not. And if it is, uh, it indicates that patients are pretty concerned about their safety around STIs. And this is an empowering option. Yeah, yeah. No, I think, I think that's a very good point. Um, there were no objective measures of um, uh, PrEP adherence in that study, so hard to, to judge. But, um, but yeah, I think the, the very high rate of reported adherence um, in contrast to the primary outcome showing no effect to me does suggest that um, uh, people may have been self-reporting greater adherence. It's interesting though, because adherence was also pretty high in the other studies, the MSM studies, and so and those did show an effect. So there, at least there must have been some correlation since they, you know, there was. Yeah. A, there was, so and they, that's also interesting to me that you know you usually don't expect to see eighty plus percent adherence to yeah. something that you know a self-driven uh, medication trial. So you know maybe patients are more concerned about their risk than we you know give them credit for. Sometimes. Yeah. They they did make she did make the presenter did make the point that. Um, the uh, genie that the um oh no that was the other that was the docs the, that was the prep study i'm not gonna no you're right yep <laughs> I, was, I was gonna uh, make the comment that genie presented um data suggesting that um you know the part of the reason that there may have been a, a greater efficacy among the four dose per week arm is that these were all women who knew what they were getting they were open label they knew they were getting the active agent as opposed to previous studies, which have been randomized um, and people didn't know what they were getting. Okay, um, Winston had a comment. I would think that the contacts to STIs would also be good candidates for doxypep, even if they do not test positive themselves. I haven't seen any mention of contacts in any of these studies. Nope, uh, there was no mention of contacts in any of the studies. Um, and um, and I don't think uh, I don't there were there were some studies presented which I didn't present that did look at um, uh, I think one did look at doxypep among um, uh, 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 contacts um, but I don't think in the um, counterfactual scenarios I don't think contacts delivering to contacts well they can't do that that's in the EMR. So um, that was not a scenario. So I think I think there are a limited amount of data, but I, I did not present them, but I totally agree with you. Okay, uh, two last questions um, from one from Dave Grilotti. Are there uh, studies on event related on-demand doxy prep? And Winston put a comment about the only study that he's aware of was an open labeled RCT of uh, Doxy, 100 milligrams and 30 MSM living in HIV in LA, uh, Jeff Klausner's group. Yeah, if there's a, Jeff Klausner actually wrote a really nice review where he covers all of the very small open label and RCTs for Doxy, PEP and PrEP um, in 2022, I think. Um, and so I would refer you to that because um, he does go through all of the presented and published data on Doxy, PEP and PrEP prior to the um, release of the Ypergay and uh, the Ypergay had been released, but prior to the DoxyVac and DoxyPep <laughs> studies presented here. Okay, uh, and then last question from Adam Bortner. Uh, how might the uh, MenB vaccine data change your practice? Um, I mean, I, again, I think, I guess personal opinion um, with our relatively low rates of gonorrhea resistance, it was not clear to me that that is necessary in the US in an international setting, in any setting where gonorrhea resistance is um, um, uh, high, I think it is a much more effective strategy than um, doxy. Um, however, in the US, given that many of the populations we're treating with doxy PEP are also at risk for uh, meninge, <laughs> you might just, you know, we might just do both um, uh, as part of, you know, I think um, uh, uh, meninge B vaccine is already recommended in many of these populations. Okay. And durability, um, I don't know. I actually have one last question from, from yep. myself. Uh, doxy, using doxypep, uh, obviously will affect the, you know, our ability to track STIs. Um, 
is that a concern in terms of from an epi standpoint being able to monitor and follow trends uh, what do you mean by i mean all of these folks still had quarterly three site sti testing yeah yeah i i, I guess you know if the use of doxy pep over time decreases all the I, STIs, I, I don't know. I mean, will we see like this this trend of decreasing STIs? Will that affect then funding to then get, you know, Oh, studied let's go and, and try. Let's find out. <laughs> we'll try. Okay, good, good, good. So, I mean, yeah, the hope is that it will affect the epidemiology yeah. um, and the, the frequency with which STIs are being seen. I think, you know, the, the million dollar question, which, you know, Annie's study addressed in very limited follow-up was the, the selection or occurrence of drug resistance. And it does not seem to be a major issue, even for you know, um, uh, the um, staff and the non-commensal, uh, um, the commensal uh, Neisseria strains and uh, um, et cetera. So I think at this point, I did not feel like there were a lot of negatives to this, but I think anybody that moves into this you know off label use um needs to understand the follow up at present is very limited um you know a year ish um for most of these studies um but the effect is so huge yeah i have to agree <laughs> all right well let's uh let's go ahead and end today's session thanks again uh dr little for an excellent presentation uh, just a reminder, uh, if you're claiming CME credit, uh, please check the um, the chat pod. There is a, uh, instructions about how to do that. Uh, the code today is 440, uh, texting that to 866-858-2208. Uh, and you have to do that within 60 minutes of the end of this presentation. <laughs> so uh, please do that. Uh, next week, I will be presenting uh, data on metabolic data. Uh, findings from the uh, CROI presentations. Yay. So uh, I may answer some of uh, the questions that were posed today. So cool. uh, see you next week. And thank, thank you, thank you thank everyone. You. Have a good day. Bye-bye.